Amen. Tonight, a special friend of mine will be sharing the word. Um, Pastor Russell Evans from Planet Shakers, so you don't want to miss it. And then this morning, I want us to stand to our feet, please, because that's what we do as CRC, as we welcome uh, a part of our family, somebody that we love, Sp spoke at the um, Women's Conference, um, spoke at Dream Week last year. Um, she's a TV host and executive producer at TBN UK. She was the first woman of color to ever host a network late night show in America during a 20 year career. Launched on MTV, she has hosted everything from live events to talk shows to self titled specials. She's a dynamic uh, woman of God with a great testimony. And recently, I've been uh, talking on sharing your story because your story matters. The pain that you've gone through. The healing that you receive, God wants to use that. You know, when we stop telling our story to people is the day that we lose our fire and our connection with God because God blessed us to be a blessing. So I want us to put our hands together as we welcome to the platform this morning, Cynthia Garrett. Come on right here in Pretoria. Come on the brothers as well. Give a big, big shout. Bless you. Thank love you. you. Bless you back and love you back. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, our stories, our stories, our stories, the greatest thing we have to give. Let's pray. Let's start in prayer. Good morning. <laughs> um, but I always want to start in prayer before I say another word, because actually if he doesn't show up, even hello, I'll make a mess up. So, Father, I just want to acknowledge that in you I live and I move and I have my being. So, Father, I ask this morning that you would help all of us to sit in your presence and to hear from you. Lord, the greatest thing that we have to give is our story. So I ask that you help me to share my story with you, my journey with you, my overcoming with you, with all of them. Because I understand that as it says in Revelation 12 verse 11, yes, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, Lord, and I know that we will love not our lives unto death, just as your word says. So I love you, and I worship you, and I serve you, and I am so happy that you've chosen to use me and to use my mess and make a message. In Jesus' name, we say amen. <laughs> amen. So everyone, please be seated. Ah, uh, it's, uh, wow. First of all, I have to start by saying that um, it's Mother's Day and Happy Mother's Day. And on Mother's Day, I, I, I sort of have this kind of interesting celebration of Mother's Day because um, Woman Meet Your Son were probably the greatest words that I have ever heard or experienced in my life. And my son is a great part of my testimony. But that Woman Meet the son part of when I met Jesus in my testimony is just, it was the greatest day. And I was one of those women who got saved while I was pregnant. So the woman being saved in childbirth scripture, while I know it applies to different things, also I felt applied to me so personally because my son is such a part of what God used to save my life. And so on Mother's Day, I'm always remembered that the greatest gift that God gave me in the journey of my story with him has been my child, my son. So happy Mother's Day, because I truly believe that being a mom is the greatest thing, and it's the best thing I've ever done. And I lay down my life for my son, and he saves my life constantly, and I just love that kid. <laughs> I just love my kid. So I wanted to kind of start, you know, in, in sharing my testimony, I was telling Pastor Ott, um, before we started this morning after the first service I said you know I learn so much more as I share and I share and one of the things that I really have been moving strongly into is this season of realizing that the greatest thing about our stories is when we connect with the fact that we are victors we are overcomers we've won if you've got a story to share trust me you won you won he saved you. He showed up for you. And you walked into a covenant in which you know and I know that he shows up constantly because he is faithful even when we're not. 
And so my journey, I love the scripture, be ye continually transformed by the renewing of your minds in Christ Jesus. Because as many of you know, or should know, we get saved and then we begin a journey with the Lord. And my journey with the Lord really and truly had a couple of very interesting plateau moments. The moment in which I met my Lord and Savior in a prison cell in Italy, and the moment 14, 14 years later in which I got on my face and I surrendered on a new level to my Lord and Savior. So the journey of my story to standing here in front of you today to share it has really been one in which I have experienced a number of things, like all of you. And so I like to really remind people from the moment they get saved that God doesn't promise us a rose garden, but what he does tell us is fear not. In this world, yes, you will have tribulation, but chill out, guys, because I've overcome the world. And that's awesome. And it's true. And we can really hold on to that and believe in that because it's true. And I often remind myself because in my journey of the damage in my life and the wreckage that God walked me through, I had a lot of just men issues and daddy issues to struggle with. And so it took me a long time to really trust men. Now, I was fortunate because I knew I could trust my father. But I still have to remind myself, he is not a man that he would lie. He is not a man that he would lie. He is not a man that he would lie. It doesn't matter who you've known who's ever lied to you or dropped you or abandoned you or rejected you or judged you or hurt you or betrayed you. He is not a man that he would lie. <laughs> he is not. He really is faithful. And the reason I know that he's faithful is because I'm standing here today in front of you. <laughs> And there's no reason for that but Jesus. You know, so as my story goes, I have chosen to really, and it is a choice. It is a choice. It is a choice, and it's a choice my father taught me about in the year 2000 when I got my first big network job on NBC, and I went from like the MTV Networks family to big network television. And I was given my own late night show, and, and that came with a lot of politics and a lot of stuff because I was the first woman of color to ever be given a network late night show. And so I found myself really rather young and, and in over my head in some ways, but completely gifted in other ways to do what was in front of me to do. But my father died that literally the same week that I was given that first show. And I was a daddy's girl. You know, even through all the drama of my life, I was a daddy's girl. I loved my daddy. You know, I looked like my father. And, and my father was bigger than life to me. But it was interesting because it was my father who in the year 2000 went to heaven at around 78 years old. And I'm setting sort of a reference for you because that means that my father lived through hardcore segregation in America. I mean, he, he, he experienced all of it. But at a point in his life, in 1963-64, my dad became the first black man in America to ever own banks. Now, he did this by buying seven white banks and savings and loans in the South, in Texas, where blacks still couldn't even ride together on the same bus. They couldn't use the same bathrooms. I mean, it was a crazy time. And my dad did this because he had great white friends who were brothers who ran with him from San Francisco. And they had started banks in San Francisco and they would pretend to be the owners of my father's banks. And my dad would disguise himself as a chauffeur or a janitor to get into his own board meetings, right? And my father was always one to help somebody. He wanted to help everybody and he couldn't hire black people to work in his banks. But women were being discriminated against. White women, they didn't get, they couldn't get hired, so my dad hired all of them. And that's what he did. And he said, I had to help somebody, baby, so I helped the white women because no one would hire them either back then. So I, you know, my dad was quite a character. He was bigger than life. And I remember asking him, because when my father got ill, I mean I laid aside every bit of mad that you got divorced from mom, I don't understand this, I don't understand that. And like Pastor Ott said, you know, build a bridge. Doesn't matter how much you want to judge your parents. 
That bridge of communication is about you being past the baton on this relay race called life and running your race as well as you can. So I spent the last three years of my father's life when he got sick at his bedside asking him questions, question after question after question. And one of the questions I said to him was, Dad, what is the greatest lesson you've learned in life? Because now I have this big job. I'm a woman of color. I'm, I was feeling a lot of pressure from a lot of black organizations to really represent well and kind of being used as a face in a lot of ways. I understand that. But then I really, you know, I, I, I didn't know what a lot of it meant. My mom, my mom has, a, has, a, has a white face. My son has a white face. And so I said, talk to me about being a black woman and representing well, and what should we be thinking as black people? And he said, you know what, daughter? He said, I got to tell you something. He said, there are two things you need to know about life. People can't get anywhere without people. You need people. Doesn't matter if they're black, white, pink, green, brown, or blue. You need people. My dad said, he goes, you know, I became what I became because a white Jewish man taught me the real estate game when I was 15, had no education, and came out here from Texas and wanted to be somebody. So you need people. Second thing he said to me was, baby girl, never be a victim. Never choose or act like a victim. Never, never desire to be treated like one. He said, because this is what you have to understand. Life is going to do you wrong. There are things that are going to happen to you that are not going to be fair. My father lost all seven of those banks and savings and loans in spite of the fact that Lyndon B. Johnson, who was our president at the time, tried to help him because of racism. Because when white politicians found out that these two black men owned these white banks, they went ballistic. And my dad's case became a case that changed banking laws in America forever. So to hear him saying these words to me, you have to understand, it was powerful. And he said, listen, he said, you know, you take 20 minutes when life deals you a bad hand and you get it out of your system, you grieve, you, you kick your feet, you cry. But after 20 minutes, you are a fool because you have got to take the hand that life has given you and you have to play it as best you can. And he said, you know, baby girl, if you choose to be a victim, you'll stop. If you sit there mad at what was done to you, you'll stop. And I have to tell you, that lesson, whew, when I ran off and got married and ended up in a nightmare, married to a man who lied to me, who had an assumed identity, who took me to prison with him, I'm telling you, it was that lesson that kept me from really and truly being consumed with bitterness. Because instead of looking at the lies he told me, I looked at myself and I said, okay, God, I can't play victim here, so what did I do what did I do? Did I do anything? And then God began to take me on this journey where I began to confront my story. Yes, I was sexually abused as a little girl in my house. And for anyone in here who understands what that's like, you have to understand there's something about sexual abuse of a child in the home. It really and truly damages your ability to be intimate. Not just intimate physically, because see, Physical intimacy, the giving of the body, that's easy. That was something that I could very easily do because I knew how to disconnect and keep my mind and my heart firmly implanted inside of me behind walls. You know, I learned. I learned to self-protect. Eventually, I learned to self-medicate because when you've got that much stuff inside of you that you're protecting, you will grow up, get into your 20s, and probably try everything that I did to fill the void if Jesus isn't there. So when I was a young girl, I was dealing with this stuff in my home and for, at the hands of a relative. I didn't even know until later that my only sister, I grew up in a house full of boys. My father had in total nine kids from three marriages, six with my mom, one with his first wife, and two with his last wife. And he was friends with all of them until the day he died. My mom and my dad were like this until the day he died. You know, I have to tell you, in this baby mama generation we live in, I got to tell you, my mother never said a bad word about my father, ever, ever. Because she always said, it is not my right to poison you against your father, even if he was Hitler. A child deserves to make their own opinions and decisions about their, other, their parents. They do, and she knew as a woman that to get in front of that would deprive me of something I needed, even if what I needed was the illusion that I had a great father. 
And I'm speaking now to a whole generation that literally has contented themselves to be called baby mamas and cause all kinds of drama for daddy who's not there. And yes, this is a fatherless generation we are in. And I am in pain about that because being a father means so much. And God would introduce me to that as he restored my home later. So of course, by the time I got to be about 15 years old, I was raped as a teenager. I was in a myriad of confusion about sex and sexuality and myself and my body and just all of it, you know? And so I, as I said this morning, I began to form all these walls. I knew how to put up walls. By the time I got to high school, I was firmly protected behind my walls. Walls of anger, walls of fear, walls of rejection, walls of pain, walls of hurt, walls of betrayal, walls of feeling deceived and abandoned. Because by the time I got to high school, my parents had also gotten a divorce. And while they had a divorce in the best of all ways, I was a daddy's girl and I missed my dad. I missed my dad. And my mom did the best that she could. But then now here she was a single mom with six kids. I'm the oldest of six kids. So I took on an extraordinary amount of responsibility to make sure that my brothers and sisters were okay and were raised well. My mom had to go to work for the first time. So life got really different and things were really hard and we've all been through hard stuff. So I can relate to a lot of stuff that people go through as a single mom. I had one and I would become one, little did I know. So, of course, by the time I got to uh, college, you know, I had really and truly perfected the art of looking for love in all of the wrong places. I really had. And um, I didn't really have any grid for what a good marriage looked like. I didn't really have a lot of self-esteem because sexual abuse and rape taught me a horrible lesson. That lesson was, number one, shame. Number two, guilt. The weight of shame and guilt are probably two of the heaviest weights that you can carry on your life. That's why one of my joys and my passions today is seeing women come free and men come free from that shackle called sexual abuse. It is not your fault. It is not your fault. You were a child. It is not your fault. And that was an important thing for me to hear at a certain point in my journey because I thought it was my fault. You know, I even actually thought it was God's fault for a long time. You know, a lot of us have testimonies in which we know that we know that there were times that we were angry with God and figured God existed for everyone else, but clearly not for us because where was he? How could this happen? I was the innocent. So eventually I got into my 20s and, and I fell in love with my, my college boyfriend. He was bigger than life, like my father. He uh, was a, actually a superstar athlete at a university called Stanford University in America. So he was bright, he was gifted, he was all of that. And I was constantly picking my dad. My dad was that bigger than life guy. Through my journey with Jesus, I would learn that the man I needed to pick needed to be like my grandfather. He was the godly guy who showed up at five to noon if he said he'd be there at noon. He was the man that was so about his word, he would die to let his yes mean yes and his no mean no. There was zero double-mindedness in my grandfather. So it took a while before I realized that my grandpa was a godly guy. He was a Proverbs 31 man. <laughs> See, it took me a while to figure out that what I needed was a Proverbs 31 man. It also took me a while to become a Proverbs 31 wife, and I'm still working on it. But a lot of you have to understand, male or female, that a lot of times, especially when you're young, you think, oh, I want to be married, oh, I want to be married, oh, I want a spouse. I look at so many young people today, and I say, well, what makes you attractive as a spouse? That you should have a spouse. I mean, you gotta be the change that you wanna see in the world, to quote Mother Teresa. So are you the spouse that you would want someone to be to you? Now, until you become that, don't run around saying, I can't wait to find my man, I can't wait to find my girl, I can't wait to have a spouse. No, focus yourself on being the spouse. Because you will draw to yourself that which you are. So it does not surprise me that in my brokenness and in my confusion and in my pain and behind all my walls, all I really drew to myself 
was other broken men, other broken people. I drew images of me to me. That's what you get. You get yourself until you deal with yourself. Okay? So I ended up, because of the heartbreak of, of, of this relationship, to the first guy that I dropped a lot of my walls with in college. We were going to get married, all of the above. But what man meant for evil, God meant for good. See, he cheated, he broke my heart, I was devastated, I went into all of my issues deeply, and then I started abusing myself because the pain got to be too much. I was 25, 26 years old, and all of a sudden, here I am, I've graduated from law school in the top of my class, top 10 law school in America. On the outside, I put together the perfect package. I was smart, I was gifted, and I was determined. I was going to prove, like the guys, that I was somebody. I had that guy thing in me. While most girls wanted to get married, I wanted a career. I wanted to prove my worth. And I thought that proving my worth and getting back at all of that abuse was about achievement. It was about my identity in my career. So when this guy broke my heart, I was like, you will live to regret the day you broke my heart. I am somebody. And you know, I know some of you get that because we get driven by so many of the wrong things. But you know, a lot of that drive was helping me to survive. It was helping me to survive my story. And so in order to get back at him, one of the things that I decided that I was going to do was run off and marry this really good looking guy who came into my life. I knew him a month. 19 red flags went off from the second he said hello. God began talking to me in my spirit, and, I, and I, I always knew God. I wasn't saved. I wasn't surrendered. My mom knew to send us to Catholic school, and I would sit when I was being sexually abused as a young girl, and I would say to God, why did this happen? I knew there was a God. I knew he was talking to me, and one of the things that God would always say to me is, baby girl, it's spiritual warfare. The bad spirits want to kill your good spirit. I had a very childish conceptual ability to understand from day one that this life entails spiritual warfare. I knew it, but I didn't know what that meant or what to do with it. So when all the red flags went off, because I met this guy who was really good looking and seemed to want to rescue me because he looked at my life and he decided he had to marry me. So by the, by the time he left me in California, went back to Europe because he was a famous model in Europe, which was so unlike me because I'd never dated anyone outside of school. So I was stepping into a world because of a lot of my pain and I was about to make the biggest mistake of my life by running off to a foreign country and marrying this man and in 10 days of being married to him, I was abused mentally, spiritually and physically. I would way rather have physical abuse than mental abuse. Trust me, it is true. There are women all over the world who know that mental abuse is one of the worst forms of abuse you can ever experience. Being called out of your name, being put down and belittled and having your mind controlled is one of the worst forms of bondage I have ever been in in my life. He was really a bad man. And I found that out on our honeymoon when I discovered that this man, who I'd known a total of three months and had spent a month with before marrying him, and spending 10 days with him. And on day 10, on our honeymoon, I discovered him in our car, trafficking drugs with kilos of cocaine in the dashboard. We're now in Italy, I freak out. I take the car when he leaves me alone to go and meet someone. I go and I throw all this stuff out of the car in broad daylight on the side of a road to get back to the hotel, try to call for help. I didn't know how to call for help. At that point, I didn't speak Italian. Within about six months of this story, I would be fluent in Italian. I am gifted to communicate. How many of you know that God will prepare you over and over and over again in your gifting? Yes. So I needed to be free of this, and that was what I thought would get me free. And I would have been, until he came back to the room, almost killed me, took me out on the road to look for these drugs, and all of a sudden we're surrounded by armed military police. I am interrogated for two days. I am looked at not like I was actually guilty of his crime, but like I had to be the stupidest moron on the planet <laughs> that this clearly American girl who had a bit of what looked like 
some good background, married this guy that they, unbeknownst to me, had been watching, and ended up married him after three months. I mean, they looked at me like, normal people don't do this. <laughs> and I remember looking at them like, but I'm not normal. I'm in so much pain right now. He was better than the famous friends who were beginning to get me into a lot of drugs and alcohol to deal with my pain. So see, I looked at him as a way out, and he was looking at me as a way in. Man, Satan will work an agenda while you are over here struggling to figure out who God is and what God is. And you've got to understand that in the spiritual warfare over your life that your testimonies and your stories are about, he wants to kill you. Satan wants to kill your calling. He wants to steal the seed inside of you that God is trying to birth and he's trying to get it at all costs. I realize in my story that God's pursuit of me was relentless. It was relentless. I had made my bed in hell, like the scripture says, and he was there. So now I'm arrested with this man that I barely know, who it turns out has an assumed identity, duh, and is trafficking drugs all over the world to buy arms for the Serbian movement and the Serbian civil war in Yugoslavia at the time. Remember the ethnic cleansing, the, men, the, the women and children being raped and killed? That one. So I wake up in a nightmare. It took me two years of trials to get home. But it was what happened in the prison cell there three months that gave me the two greatest things in my life. And I promise you, as real as I stand before you this morning, I would go through everything again and again and again to have the two greatest gifts God gave me. The first was my son. My 25-year-old son today, who was on fire for Jesus, who was athletic and gorgeous and gifted, and he loves so deeply that I am so proud of him. I sit sometimes and I look at him. I just look at him. I look at him. I'm amazed at him, at him who went through college vocal about celibacy, him who went through college determined to save everybody, bring him to his mom and dad, because part of the story for me, entails restoration. A man who came into my life as a friend and a prayer partner when my son was 14 going on 15 and there was all out war going on in my household. I did not know what to do with this, with this child because I realized at that point that while I'd been saved 14 years prior, I had not really raised my son up in the word the way that I should. And I came out of that experience in Italy and I stepped into God's blessings. I mean, he blessed me. I came out of a prison cell. My childhood dreams of working on TV and having famous friends and being around people who make movies and, and, and being in a creative world, God gave me all of it. He gave me all of it. And I went, thank you so much, Lord. Get in the back seat. We're going on a great ride. And every now and then I would turn around and say, are you having fun? Thank you so much for this blessing. And I got so distracted with the blessings that I drifted from the savior that met me in a prison cell in Italy. And that is the second greatest thing that I received out of my story. On day three, locked in this prison cell in isolation, <laughs> terrified, not sure if my mom or my dad or my family knew whether or not I was alive, not sure if I would ever get out of that cell in less than the 21 years they told me I would surely be doing with him in that prison. And I went to sleep that night and I remember having a dream and I, I, I share this and I have no, I don't even know if it was a vision because it was so real. Dream, vision, open vision, was I awake, was I, I don't know. All I know is that an angel appeared to me and she was on a cloud and she was dressed in white from head to toe. I went to Catholic schools in my young life, so I immediately recognized her as a nun of some sort, an angel, a nun, that's what she was dressed like. But the thing that really got me was that she looked exactly like my grandmother. My mother's mother is Italian, Sicilian. So I grew up with a knowledge of Italian in my home and she had brown hair and big blue eyes and so did this angel in my dream. And in my dream, she held out this book to me and she said, do you know what this is? This is God's word and he's gonna send it to you and if you read it, he'll save you and change your life. 
I drift off to sleep. The next morning, I get a knock on the door. I am woken up by a, the woman who ran the woman's side of the prison, who turned out to be such a blessing because she had daughters my age. And she looked at me, and when we could eventually communicate after a few months when I was fluent in Italian, she said to me, I just knew that you weren't guilty. She said, I've run, a woman's, I've won, run the woman's side of the prison for 25 years. Guilt is in the eyes, and I can see it. I thought you were really stupid, though, because I couldn't understand how on earth you could run off and marry a man that you barely knew. And by that point, I could explain to her, I am in so much pain. I was trying to escape so much that was inside of me. And how many of you know that wherever you go, there you are? You can't run from your story. You have to confront it. And the only way that you can confront it and win is to confront it with Jesus Christ as your savior, because he's the one who wins for you. So I get this knock on my cell door and Mariucci is standing there with a girl, a little girl named Rita. Rita was in the cell next door with her sister, Marilena, and they were in prison for helping their boyfriends rob a bank. There's a lot of poverty in their region. Uh, you know, I said this morning, one of the things I really got over quickly was, who I was, <laughs> my education, my friends, oh my God, my dreams, my aspirations, because it was like, you know what, kid, playing field is level, you're in jail. You're just like them. The only thing anybody wanted was to be free. And so I actually thought, God, I don't even know if I know what freedom looks like, because on the outside of this prison, I was in bondage. And in that prison, I have to tell you, they stood there with an English-Italian dictionary, and they translated to me that there was someone who was coming to see me. And so I said, okay. Now, I didn't know I would learn that it was the nun that was in charge of the prisons. That was her job in her convent, was to visit the prisons. So I look down the hall as she comes walking, and I hear this little fast-paced clip, and all of a sudden, here comes this nun, She's dressed in white from head to toe. She has big blue eyes. She looks exactly like my grandmother, and she's holding a book. And as she comes into view, she says to me, do you know what this is? This is God's word. And if you read it, he will save you, and it will change your life. And I look at the cover of the book, and just like in my dream, on it, it said the good news, the good news Bible. I fainted, they picked me up, I got on the top bunk in my room, and I started reading that book. That Bible, a good news Bible, I call it the Bible equivalent for third graders. And I love it because one of the things I always share is in your story, don't think you have to get all hoity-toity with big words. Just get to know Jesus. Read a Bible translation you can understand. Because I grew up in Catholic school, never understood the Bible. It was boring. If, if it were for King James, I would not be saved. It's true, I wouldn't. I needed the Good News Bible, the Bible for third graders. I did, I fell in love with my Savior. I started on page one and I devoured it daily, all day, that's all I did. I laid in bed, I read the Bible, I read the Bible. The world was going nuts around me. There were girls in the prison who hated me, a couple of them who wanted to beat me to death because they just didn't like the attention that my story was getting. What you have to imagine, you're gonna get some attention if all of a sudden you run off to a foreign country, you end up in a prison, you're the only American woman there, you're, you're, you look like me, you, you, you know, you, you, your, your husband has been on the cover of magazines and stuff, but he's reputedly involved in this crazy organization, and, and, and then the press gets a hold of the fact that your brother is a famous rock star. You're gonna get some attention. And it caused hatred and it caused love. So I immersed myself in Jesus because I didn't care about anything. All I knew was I was a daughter and I'd made a lot of mistakes and I needed this God that was alive on every page. And the Bible spoke to me, God spoke to me. And he began the first step of my transformation. There would be a lot more to come. But not only did he begin that step, he made a promise to me. And I heard him speak to me in the scripture that said a woman will be saved in childbirth if she perseveres. And I knew, I knew I was pregnant, which was cray cray, as we would say, because I was told by my doctors repeatedly as a young girl that I had had trauma 
and I probably would not ever be able to conceive children with a lot of medical intervention. So here I am now in a prison, and I'm feeling like God is telling me, I mean, I start, God started talking to me in incredible ways. My poor Catholic, Roman Catholic mother thought I needed an exorcism. She really did, because she was like, I don't know what's wrong with her. At a certain point, she told her sisters, who they, they are diehard Roman Catholics, she looked at one of her sisters and she said, well, all I know is this, I don't understand the God talking to her thing, but she is a nicer person. <laughs> So, thank you, Jesus. But, but I, God made good on that promise. And about a month and a half into being in prison, I found out that I was pregnant. And, and, you know, Satan is a liar because immediately, as soon as I found out, my body started trying to reject the pregnancy, which would have been the norm because in my story, there was a point in high school where I got pregnant and with nobody around me to tell me that abortion was murder and that abortion is wrong and that you can't call yourself a Christian and be down with that. You can't grow up to be a Christian and vote for candidates that support abortion. But I had one, and I had one as a young girl. So I lay there now, and, and some of you will get this if you've ever gone through, if you've ever had an abortion. When you become pregnant with the child that you want, you will be tormented. You will grieve. You will go through all manner of repentance about the child that you didn't want because you didn't understand what you were doing. So I really, I really have to tell you, my son and the fact that God made good on that child in spite of the fact that my body was trying to reject it and I couldn't even tell anybody because as soon as I found out I was pregnant, I found out that there was also this law on the books that would prevent my detention and allow me to fight this trial under house arrest because I was pregnant. Because in Italy, a matriarchal society, they honor the pregnant woman. So praise the Lord, he had so much in store for me with this pregnancy. So eventually I would come out of that prison cell, as I said, and, and I would start my career. And my son got to be about 14 and I realized, oh no, the lack of a father, the, 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 the TV people and the famous people he's been around, and the sort of even the Christians who said, yeah, I'm Christian, thank you for the Oscar, and then went off and lived all wrong. You know, all of it. I realized, like, oh, no, I'm going to lose this child. And so I got on my face, and I counted the cost, and I counted all of it as loss because all I wanted was to know God in the way that I knew that I should know him. And I prayed a very dangerous prayer. Lord, I don't care what you have to change about my life or remove from my life. I don't care who you take away. I don't care who you leave there. All I know is that with everything that you've carried me through, there has to be a plan and a purpose, and I want to live and serve you. I want to walk in whatever that plan and purpose is and however it looks. And you know what? Eventually, God took me through a season of pruning and removal and addition. Because eventually then, I became friends with a man that I didn't realize would become my husband. We were just friends. But the Lord spoke. And yes, the Lord will speak to you about who your spouse is. I promise you, he can speak. I literally audibly heard, this is your husband. And I would have needed to. Because by that point, I was like, you know what? I have a child. I've been married, been there, done that. Don't need to really do that again. Not so good at that. Really good at being alone. Really good at being a friend with a guy. Really bad at being in a relationship. Zero grid for how to be married, how to partner, how to submit to your husband. Because I thought, I'm still not great at that, but I thought that, you know, that scripture gets so abused because if they would have only said to me, wives submit to your husbands and husbands submit to your wives, the way Christ loved the church, so much so that he died for her, then I would have thought, oh, then I need to pick a man that loves Jesus a lot and loves me the way he loves Jesus and would die for me the way Jesus died for me. So girls, if you're feeling like you just can't submit to that guy because he doesn't really love Jesus and you're really not sure that he would die for you, you're right. Don't do it. Wait for the one that will. <laughs> Wait for the one that will make you second. The one that will show up in the middle of your mess, even though you're saved, your life doesn't look very surrendered, and you've got a 14-year-old child, and the two of you call love, raging arguments and doors slamming, and your explana my explanation was, well, we're creative people. 
So that's what we do. Well, God bless the man that I met on the plane that day, the man that would eventually, through his courtship of me over four years, completely celibate, um, because we wanted that, I wanted that testimony. He had that testimony, I wanted it. And why four years? Yes, it's a long time, but there was a lot of inner healing that the Lord needed to do with me in my surrender. But he saw my calling, he supported my calling, and, and he saw my son, and he supported my son, and he mentored my son, and my son has a father that God provided, not the one that I chose, and trust me, it is better. <laughs> So I think I'm a, I'm a few minutes over, so I just want to wrap up by saying that I have found this beautiful place, honestly, thanks to Pastor Ott and, 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 and Pastor Russell really encouraged me also in Australia recently to share my story, share my story, because I'd gotten to this point where I was like, uh, uh, but then I realized, you know something, kid, God told you to write that book and share your story because it is the place where your passion was born. It is the place from which you will share the rest of your life. Every message is grounded in something I've lived. Every experience I've had, I can give it to you. And it's about you. And see, Jesus loved me so much that he, he's given me such a love of you. And I have to tell you one of the things about you as a people, and I experience it every time I come here, and you need to know this, you have an anointing on you as people for love. And, and, I, and I say anointing because look, sometimes you can love, but when God makes it an anointing, when you touch people, they're overcome by love. That's where the gift of God is at work. I weep so much when I am here because every time someone hugs me or interacts with me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm literally melted butter. I'm so overcome by the love of God, the anointing, the anointing and the anointed love that flows to me through so many of you. So I thank you for being a part of my story. I thank you for listening to my story. And I think at this point, I just want to ask all of you to bow your heads so I can quickly, I, I, I hate to go over time because I'm, I'm trying to make Pastor Ott proud of me and do everything right. And I've done a lot of live TV and I know better because I know how to get us out on time, but I've gotten caught up in my, in my segment. <laughs> but all around the sanctuary with, with eyes closed and heads bowed, I believe that there are, is somebody here that was impacted by my story. And I need you to know that I wanna offer you an invitation to step into the same relationship that I was offered in Jesus Christ. I want you to know that you're not judged, but you're loved. And he wants you. And if you're feeling anything tugging at you, just raise your hand. Raise your hand if you're feeling like, you know what, today is the day I need to just make a confession of faith. I'm at the end of myself and I want to know him. Amen. I see your hands going up all around the sanctuary. Just raise your hand. I just want to see by show of hands who wants to know Jesus, who wants to experience his power in a different way. Don't let, amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Don't let this morning pass without knowing that whatever you're going through, I promise, amen, I promise you. He is a God of restoration. I stand here before you. I look younger, feel better, sleep better, live better. My son is better. My husband is better. My life is better. Everything's better because of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now what I want you to do is grab your things and come up here to the altar so we can pray with you. Come on up. Grab your things and come down quickly. We love you. Jesus loves you and he wants you in a relationship with him. Amen. Don't waste another minute. Today is your day. Amen. Come on down. I saw you back there. Come on down. Make your way to the altar. Come on down. Amen. Amen. I pray young men in. I pray young women in. You know, many of you have been touched by the story today. You know today that your life is not right with God. We are going to keep on clapping and singing. I want you to turn to your friend, maybe your husband. You know, if you leave this earth without Jesus, there's not a purgatory. There's not a second chance. Your heart's been touched this morning. You maybe served God as a child, but you've wandered away from God. 
You take your personal belongings, leave your seat, and you come to the altar today. Come on, God loves you. Jesus died for you. God wants to give you a new beginning. Come on, God wants to heal your brokenness. God wants to change your life today. Oh, come on. Don't stay in your seat this morning, wherever you are, whoever you are. Leave your seat right now and come to the altar and give yourself back to Jesus today. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. To Jesus as you are, He's waiting for your heart. There's mercy in His arms. Come to Jesus one. Give the Lord a praise for every person making a decision today. God bless all of you. We love you. We are so proud of you. And we want to say to Cynthia, we are proud of you. We love you. What an amazing uh, ministry this morning. Come on, let's give her a big hand clap of appreciation this morning. God is writing our story, all of us. Come on, we're all a works in progress. And I want you to reach your hands out to all these beautiful people here today, all over the country, wherever you are, in all our churches. Pray this prayer right now, according to the Bible, right where you are in your seat. God loves you. Don't let guilt and shame keep you away from God. Just pray this prayer right now with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I give myself back to you. Thank you for loving me so much that you died for my sin. I believe with all my heart. You rose from the grave. I believe you are alive. Today, I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for a new beginning. Thank you for a new life. I surrender all to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And the Bible says your sins are forgiven. Let's tell our story to our world. Let's, let's, let's make this world a better place. Come on. There are so many stories in that one story we heard today, amen, many stories. But we're never going to find inner peace until we find God. Can we pray for you today? Put a good news Bible in your hands as well. Before you go home today, each and every one of you, we care about you. We want to help you in this journey that you have chosen. So here in Pretoria, if you will turn to my right, your left in Bloomington, if you will turn to my left, your right, all the other churches, follow the pastors wherever you are. Go with them right now. Come on, let's give them all a big God bless you. Come on, you matter to us. Each and every one of you, you matter. People matter. Let's make South Africa a better place. Remember to get on the phone, phone your mother. Thank you for watching this message. If you'd like to visit our church, go to www.crccapetown.co.za.